Well, hello, everyone. My name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist, and it's a real pleasure to join you at Chromium University. I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about the history of the Internet, so I thought I would share some lessons that I've learned over a fairly long period of time. So let's get started. First of all, here's some examples of predictions that didn't work out too well. How about this one? This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. Whoops. How about this one? Everything that can be invented has been invented. Charles Duell, Commissioner, U.S. Office of Patents, 1899. Can you imagine just a few years later, heavier than air aircraft fly at Kitty Hawk in 1903? And then, of course, Einstein comes along in 1904 with his four papers that upend physics. Here's another one. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country, then talked with the best people, and I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last out the year. The editor in charge of business books at Prentice Hall in 1957. Oh, I hope you take those little examples away and uh, give, give some thought to any predictions that people might uh, ask you to make. And here's one life lesson I guarantee you is always true. Everything is more complicated. The closer you look at almost anything, the more complicated it gets. That includes the entire universe, and it also includes any business that you happen to be involved in or a piece of software that you might be responsible for. So here we are in 1969. I'm a graduate student at UCLA, and my job is to program the Sigma-7 machine, which is attached to the very first packet switch of the ARPANET project uh, in, in uh, uh, October of, uh, actually it was December uh, of 1969 when we had all four nodes up and running. My job was to write software on the Sigma-7 to gather performance data from this very small four node packet switch network uh, so I was the principal um, uh, programmer for the Network Measurement Center that was run by Leonard Kleinrock, who himself had been a major force in the development of packet switching by devising queuing theoretic treatments for analyzing store and forward networks, which is what this uh, beginning uh, was all about. So we demonstrated that packet switching could work on a wide area basis with this system. And uh, just to show you how primitive it was, uh, 25 years later, Newsweek magazine invited three of us, John Postel, Steve Crocker, and me, uh, to demonstrate how crude and, and primitive the system was when we started. It took us all day to prepare this shot with the backdrop and the sketches and then finding the zucchinis and the ban banana squash uh, and the five pound tins of coffee to build the example. Now, those of you who are looking carefully at the picture will see that uh, this is a geek joke because uh, you notice that it's ear to ear and mouth to mouth and not one mouth to ear. So this network would never work. And we figured we'd let the geeks uh, notice that in the Newsweek. Yeah, the guys that took the picture, of course, didn't say a thing. Well, from the period from 1969 to 1977, a bunch of things happened. And one of the things that uh, probably one of the most important things that happened is in the spring of 1973, uh, one of my colleagues, Robert Kahn, who had worked on the ARPANET, was very involved in its architecture, uh, moved from Bolt Bear and Newman, the company that built the uh, basic ARPANET, uh, packet switching system. Uh, Bob moved to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and specifically the Information Processing Techniques Office, where he began thinking about using uh, packet switch networks and computers in command and control, which is something that JCR Licklider, uh, who was from MIT, was a, a psychologist actually, uh, but an enthusiast for the use of computers in non-numerical ways, and who was the first director of the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA, was uh, telling his friends about the intergalactic network idea he had. And when Bob got to, uh, to DARPA, he began thinking about the implications of trying to use computers for command and control. And the obvious one is that the computers would have to be in mobile vehicles and tanks and you know, ships at sea and aircraft, but the ARPANET was simply built out of dedicated telephone circuits connecting the packet switches to each other and the computers that were attached to it were in air-conditioned rooms and they certainly didn't get up and move around. So Bob came out to my laboratory at Stanford University where I had gone after finishing my PhD at UCLA 
and raised this question of building a system that would support the use of computers in command and control. And in particular, he had already begun working on a mobile packet switch network, packet radio network, which was being set up in the San Francisco Bay Area for test purposes at SRI International, and a packet satellite system over the Atlantic, which would allow multiple ground stations to share a common channel, kind of like an ethernet in the sky, to deal with ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-shore communications. By that time, uh, by, uh, by 1973, we had extended uh, the ARPANET across the Atlantic in an internal satellite link. So ARPANET actually stretched all the way into Western Europe uh, in addition to the packet radio and packet satellite network. So Bob showed up and said, we have a problem. Of course, my reaction was, what do you mean we? And he said, well, if we're going to use computers in command and control, we got to deal with mobility. We have to deal with ships at sea. So we have three different kinds of packet switch nets that we now have to figure out how to interconnect in a way that looks more or less uniform to all the computers that are attached to any of those networks. Ironically, in May of 1973, another uh, development was taking place at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which is just a few miles away from my laboratory at Stanford. Bob Metcalf and David Boggs were busy building the first ethernets. And those, uh, the idea for Ethernet stemmed from another radio network, which had been built in at the University of Hawaii called AlohaNet, which used uh, repurposed taxi radios to send text to a central computer. And the central computer would echo the text back. So you knew that it got the message. And so that idea stimulated um, uh, Bob Metcalf to come back to Xerox Park and design the Ethernet, which ran at three megabits a second which was really, really fast for those days. The backbone network of the ARPANET was only 50 kilobits a second. The packet radio net was 100 to 400 kilobits a second. The packet satellite net was 64 kilobits a second. So the ethernet was blindingly fast by comparison. So we had four different kinds of packet technologies that could potentially be part of a network of networks. So Bob and I wrote the first paper describing the the design of the TCP protocol, which later was split into TCP and IP. That was published in 1974. We began detailed specifications. And by December of 74, we had a full detailed spec of TCP. We started implementation in 1975 at three different locations, Stanford University, University College London in the UK, and Bolt Baranek and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So we already had international involvement in the internet. Don't let people tell you that the internet was a purely American invention because we had participation in my laboratory at Stanford from Japan and from France and from the UK, from Norway uh, and, uh, and other places, in addition to other international partners like the ones at UCL uh, in the UK. So lots of, of um, uh, collaboration. Uh, as we began implementation starting in 1975, we quickly discovered that we'd made errors in the design of the protocol or in its implementation. We went through four iterations. By the way, I'm not going to do this year by year. Don't worry, we won't go through 50 years of detail. Um, but by, uh, by this uh, period from 1973 to 1977, we had gone through several iterations. We finally froze the protocol design in 1978. Uh, and then uh, I had moved by that time uh, to DARPA myself to work with Bob and his colleagues and uh, was given the task of running the internet program, packet radio, packet satellite, and packet security programs. So I wanted to demonstrate that TCP IP would really work in this complex networking environment. So we set up this demo in November of 1977. We had a uh, packet radio van driving up and down the Bayshore Freeway, radiating packets going through a gateway. Today you'd call it a router, but we didn't know that, so we called it a gateway. Linking the packet radio net over on the left to the ARPANET, going all the way through the ARPANET to University College London, uh, through an internal satellite channel and then down to UCL from Norway, and then popping out of the ARPANET into another gateway into the packet satellite network, uh, which brought the uh, traffic all the way back to the U.S. Uh, East Coast to ETAM, West Virginia, through another gateway back into the ARPANET, and then all down to uh, USC Information Sciences Institute in Marina del Rey, California. So if you have been doing the math, you know that the distance between the packet radio van in the Bay Area and uh, in Los Angeles is about 400 miles, but the packet went through two synchronous satellite hops and back and forth across the Atlantic and the US twice. 
100,000 miles or thereabouts, and it worked. And I remember leaping around in my office saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked um, because it's software. I apologize for the telephone ringing, just ignore it. Uh, it'll stop after about four cycles. I'm, I should have disabled it, but I didn't. Anyway, so I'm leaping around in my office saying, it works, it works, and if you know anything about software, you know that it's a miracle when software works. So that was a very important milestone in the whole story of, uh, of the internet. And then other government agencies have become uh, or became uh, interested in this packet switching idea, in particular, the National Science Foundation. So around 1982, they decided to build what they called CSNet, Computer Science Network, uh, which linked a number of computer science departments together. Some of them connected to the ARPANET and some of them connected to the public uh, X25 packet switch nets were the first com commercial packet switching services. And then some were using simply dial up telephones in order to move email around. So that CSNet thing um, worked quite well and it whetted the taste at NSF to link all of the 3000 research universities in the US to the five supercomputer centers that NSF was uh, sponsoring. And they decided to build an NSF net backbone and a dozen intermediate level networks to connect the various universities so they could get access to supercomputer resources. What was exciting about that is that it was a very big task. The network got built in the mid 1980s. It, the demand for it uh, took off like a rocket. They went from one and a half megabits to uh, to um, let me see how we went from one and a half to two point. I'm sorry, one and a half megabits to 45 megabits to 155 megabits. And then eventually we ended up in the 2.4 gigabit range uh, in the early 1990s for this backbone network. In the meantime, the Department of Energy and NASA also built backbone networks all in accordance with the TCP IP protocols and then interlinked them together. Then in Europe, in the uh, sort of late 1980s, early 1990s, we started to see additional research networks popping up and being interconnected. And NSF actually uh, invested in international connections to link those various research networks around the world into this growing global system. By 1989, um, we had uh, started to see commercial services offering internet to the general public and to the private sector in the United States. And by 1995, this was a well enough developed uh, system that the NSF decided to shut down its NSF net backbone and tell the universities to just go buy the service uh, from commercial sources. So it was a major step and NSF deserves a lot of credit for having taken steps to help commercialize uh, the internet backbone. This is what the internet looks like now. This is a, actually is a fairly old picture of a, a border gateway protocol routing map that shows uh, the connectivity of literally hundreds of thousands of networks scattered all around the world. And the point I wanna make with this chart is that these networks are run independently of each other. They, uh, they don't uh, have any central control. There's no central management of the internet except for assuring that domain names and IP addresses are assigned uniquely. And that's the job of the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. But uh, this really shows you that the operators of the networks of the internet can pick their own hardware, they can pick their own software, they can decide who to connect to and on what terms and conditions. We didn't dictate any business models. Some could be non-for-profit, some are government run, some are uh, private, uh, you know, for-profit operations. The system works because they're all following the same set of protocols in the TCP IP protocol suite. So I really don't need to, uh, to tell you in detail how this works, I suspect you all do, but for people that don't really know, I used a uh, postcard analogy to say that postcards behave the same way as, as internet packets. They get lost, they get out of order. Uh, although in the internet, sometimes they get duplicated. And as far as I know, the post office doesn't do that for you. But because it's, uh, it's a best efforts uh, layer of protocol, you have to put something on top to discipline it. That's called the transmission control protocol. And I uh, usually offer an analogy of trying to send a book to a friend through the postal mail. If the postal mail is only based on postcards, you know, you have to tear the pages out and cut them up and number them so that you can get them back in order. Here's what's important about this architecture. 
the internet layer of protocol was designed to not know how it's being carried. And we did that on purpose, hoping that any time a new transmission technology would come along, that it could be swept into the internet architecture easily. So when optical fiber networking came along, we just plopped the IP protocol down on top of that. And it worked just fine, didn't have to change a thing. With regard to uh, the upper uh, interface down you know, to the IP layer, the internet protocol layer does not know what it's carrying. It knows it has a payload of bits, but it doesn't know what the bits mean. And that turns out to be a very important design choice because if somebody wanted to invent a new application so that the bits could be interpreted as video or audio or a web page or a piece of text or something else, the network doesn't have to know and it doesn't want to know what does it mean. All they know is get this packet from source to destination with some probability greater than zero. So the layered structure and the sort of ignorance of the IP layer has allowed for enormous amounts of exploration of new applications and new protocols that the architecture would permit to be put in place either horizontally or vertically. So it's an extremely open, deliberately open architecture. Cloud computing is of course turning out to be super important. And those of you who uh, are making use of cloud today will know that. And I, I remember when I joined Google and, and saw the cloud activity, I remember thinking, hmm, back in the day, there used to be proprietary networking and you couldn't hook different brands of computers together until we developed TCP IP for that purpose. Now we have clouds that don't necessarily interconnect with each other and you can see it coming. The clouds are gonna have to interconnect. We'll have to devise various and sundry uh, standards for allowing inter-cloud intercommunication and you see at Google, of course, Kubernetes and Anthos being examples of enhancing that inter-cloud capability. Uh, you might go to one cloud to take advantage of special purpose uh, processing like GPUs and CPU, TPUs, and maybe someday QPUs if we are successful in getting our quantum computing into a, a shape that's, uh, that's useful. And then the other thing I want to emphasize is that security has become an increasing, increasingly important aspect of internet. And so you see HTTPS and TLS and QUIC and IPsec at different layers in the architecture uh, introducing uh, cryptographic security. And then we re recently announced confidential computing. I'm sure that'll pop up in other sessions, but I just want to emphasize how important it is because we're using hardware crypto in order to isolate people from each other inside the cloud. Uh, not only from other customers that are in our cloud, but even from Google itself, the users are running encrypted hard, encrypted uh, programs and encrypted data that, uh, that we don't have access to by choice uh, as part of our service. And then of course there's DNSSEC and RPKI, uh, the routing uh, public key crypto architectures. These are slowly uh, propagating into the net, sort of like IPv6. Uh, two-factor authentication beyond corp or other things that we've introduced to help our customers secure their use of the, of the cloud. And then there's a Chronicle organization which was exported and re-imported into the cloud in order to help people understand what threat vectors there are out there. Finally, I'm very proud of the fact that Google has been uh, a contributor to open source, as you all know, Android, Chromium OS, and Chromium, the browser, and so on. All of that is intended to enhance uh, the ability of others to uh, use the uh, internet and the cloud architecture to enhance their products and services. Unfortunately, there's still a whole lot of business still to be done. And uh, I draw your attention to this because some of you will presumably solve some of these outstanding problems. And I know we have a focus on many of them as well here at Google. Uh, one of them, of course, has to do with securing the you know, IoT devices. And my big worry there is that these are often very low cost devices. Um, we're talking about tens of dollars, maybe hundreds of dollars. And so the producers are often reluctant to spend very much money on the software. So they just grab stuff from available open source libraries, throw it into the device and then say, uh, thank you, I have your money, bye for now. My reaction, of course, is that people that buy these devices expect them to be maintained and supported. Uh, for the lifetime of the device. So uh, there are criteria that I believe should be uh, incorporated into the design and implementation of these kinds of systems, reliability, safety, privacy, security, interoperability, and autonomy in the sense that you don't want your house to stop working when the internet connection breaks. 
so machine learning and AI uh, are similarly uh, important to us, increasingly so. And I would say the same desirable criteria apply to AI and machine learning as should apply to software for the Internet of Things. We should care a great deal about being able to upgrade software after we find mistakes with it or possibly can add new functionality, but you need to have to make sure that the software comes from a reliable source uh, and also that it hasn't been altered on its way. So once again, digital signatures can be very helpful in assuring the consumer that the software updates are coming from the right place. Uh, everyone here who has uh, experienced social networking can appreciate the next bullet here of misinformation, disinformation, and the big concerns that all of us have about how to distinguish good quality information from information which is intended to or uh, has inadvertently uh, had the effect of misleading. Critical thinking is your friend here. Where did this information come from? Uh, it, it, is, is there any corroborating information that would uh, uh, reinforce uh, your willingness to believe it? Uh, is it, is it what, what does the source of that information intend in getting you to believe that information? Are they trying to get you to do something you don't want to do? I think this is critical thinking is just a portion of the broader sense of digital literacy. What can go wrong in a network environment? How should I protect myself? What do I do about passwords and two-factor authentication? Are there all the various things that, that people should learn to do to be safer in an online environment? And of course, they are not totally safe. There are people who are determined to abuse the infrastructure uh, for their own gain and purposes. And because the victims might be in a jurisdiction other than the one that the uh, perpetrator is in, we have both national and international law enforcement challenges ahead of us in order to deal with tracking down perpetrators in order to bring them to justice. And that's going to require a lot of arm wrestling and uh, negotiation uh, in the uh, what I'll call digital diplomacy space. I realize that uh, we may run short of time here, so I'm going to run through this a little more quickly. Uh, I think it should be obvious to you that uh, software is at uh, the core of almost everything related to the internet and the cloud. And unfortunately, in the some 80 years with, uh, that we've been writing software, not me personally, I didn't start writing software until I was, it's probably 1960 or 61. Um, in any case, software has bugs, and we don't know how to absolutely guarantee that they we won't create bugs in software. And those, of course, will be discovered, and they will be uh, exploited by uh, people who don't have your best interests at heart. And so figuring out how to cope with malware and buggy software uh, is a huge challenge. I think we, we need to build better tools for designing and implementing software. Uh, for modeling the software and understanding its behavior, recognizing when a mistake has been made. Some of the mistakes are really stupid. You know what they are, the buffer overflow problems, the problem of referring to a variable that's never been set, uh, or you know, branch, uh, a branch decision that goes to a random place. Those are all stupid mistakes that programmers make, and unfortunately, most of the tools that we use to write software don't necessarily highlight those. And so that for the academic community, my challenge is go figure out how to build better software development environments to avoid making stupid mistakes. You can see what the consequences are of having mistakes in the software. I mean, think about software that's making autonomous decisions. That's true of most IoT devices. You just turn them on, you configure them, and then they run, and you hope they do the right thing. If they don't, there could be severe side effects. Uh, worse than just overheating the house. I mean, especially if it happens to be a self-driving car or a self-flying drone or a free-standing free, uh, robot. Uh, mistakes in the software can really have serious consequences. Worst case scenarios, of course, are in medical instrumentation. So this leads me to the last point, which is that I believe we should be teaching programmers uh, that they should feel a, an ethical burden about the quality of their software and the software-based systems that they build and to feel strongly motivated to make sure that they don't make mistakes or if they do, that they have provided in the design for uh, up, uh, updating software, correcting mistakes, and doing so in a safe and secure way. 
Well, there's another problem associated with the internet. It isn't everywhere we would like it to be, or at least where I would like it to be. So my job as the chief internet evangelist is to get everybody up online on the net. Right now, it's only about 53% completed. So we still have a lot of work to do. The digital divide is not just about access. You know, it is about a variety of things. Is there infrastructure to support the internet? Is it cost too costly? How do we drive cost out? Are there policy inhibitors for access to the net? Some governments don't want people to get access to the public internet, or they want to filter and control what access they have. What if you don't know how to use the internet? What if you haven't got the right training so that you could become a software developer and export your product out of country? There are all kinds of reasons why education is so important, and the internet itself may be uh, a source of solution for that. We're seeing this today as as difficult as it has been to go online for education, uh, we've seen an enormous quantity of that uh, by, uh, by necessity because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think you're also seeing very successful examples like Georgia Tech with its master's degree program, literally thousands of students taking online courses, costing much less because the class sizes are larger and the cost is divided over a, a larger number of uh, recipients. So we have a lot of work to do to get the internet to go where we want it to go. I've been astonished at the amount of connectivity and undersea cabling. Google is a big investor in undersea cable. And sometimes we actually build our own without even partnering with anybody else because the costs have come down pretty dramatically from the early days of subsea optical networking. Uh, here's another wonderful Washington lesson. Friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. I li I've lived in the D.C. area since 1976, so I guarantee you I've experienced this particular uh, <clears throat> life lesson more than once. Uh, everybody here knows about the Internet of Things, so I won't bore you with walking through all of this. But it, what is astonishing to me is uh, how people have figured out how to use software to recreate and reinvent things. Uh, uh, just over my shoulder, you can't see it, is a uh, cycling uh, uh, web uh, um, picture frame, which is cycling through images coming from other family members. So the grandparents get up in the morning, and we can see what the grandchildren are doing without having to log in anywhere. Uh, I have to say, of all the various things that have been web-enabled, though, the thing that really surprised me was the surfboard that you see. This guy must have got bored sitting on the water waiting for the next wave. So he puts a laptop in the surfboard and he puts a Wi-Fi service at the rescue shack and he surfs the internet while he's waiting for the next wave for his surfboard. I remember telling jokes that someday every light bulb will have its own IP address. Well, it's not a joke anymore, as many of you know. Uh, there are exactly such uh, things like the Philips Hue, among other products. So I actually made a list of things that you know I could think of about things you could do with internet-enabled devices. And I have to tell you, if you have an, inter uh, an internet-enabled refrigerator, if everything you put in it had a little RFID chip, the refrigerator would know what it had inside. So it could be surfing the internet looking for recipes to make for dinner. So when you get home, you could see on the screen, you know, choices of things to eat. I thought that was kind of cool. And then I discovered that the Japanese company had made a bathroom scale that was connected to the internet. And so when you stepped on the scale and figured out which family member you were based on your weight, and then it transmitted that to the doctor. <laughs> and of course, that seemed like a perfectly good thing to do, except I realized the refrigerator is on the same network. And so now when you come home, you see diet recipes coming up on the display, or maybe it just refuses to open because it knows you're on a diet. Sounds like a terrible future, doesn't it? Well, there are other examples, but we don't really have time to go through all of them. So I'll let you speculate about what they might mean. Uh, I did want to finish up, though, telling you about another development, which uh, started in 1998, uh, just after the uh, Pathfinder landed on Mars in 1997. It was the first successful mission to Mars since 1976, when the US landed two Viking rovers, or they weren't rovers, but two Viking landers on the surface of Mars. 20 years went by and nobody succeeded in getting anything onto the surface successfully. And then the Pathfinder landed in 97. So in 1998, uh, I got together with a team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena to uh, start working on what we thought would be needed 25 years later. And that's 25 years after 1998. So we're talking 2023. Uh, and we said, can we design and build an interplanetary internet? So we started doing a design. We quickly discovered TCP IP didn't work. 
And uh, and then we said, well, you know, what do we do about the fact that the uh, distances between the planets are literally astronomical, the speed of light is too slow, the uh, in the worst case scenario, Earth to Mars is 20 minutes one way, 40 minutes round trip time. Imagine trying to do flow control of TCP type, uh, you know, which is basically stop and run out of room with a 20 minute round trip time. It doesn't work. Then we've got planetary rotation. And <clears throat> if you're trying to talk to something on the surface of Mars, suddenly, you know, you can't talk to it anymore because it's rotated out of view. We don't know how to stop that. So we concluded that we had a disrupted and variably delayed networking environment, and we designed a new suite of protocols we call bundle protocols in order to overcome those deficiencies or those challenges that TCP IP would be too brittle uh, to overcome. By 2004, we had prototype software you know, running uh, in laboratory settings, and that was the year when uh, Spirit and Opportunity landed in January on the surface of Mars, the original design was to transmit data back to the, uh, to Earth through what was called the Deep Space Network, which were big 70, minute, 70 meter dishes in Madrid, Spain, uh, in Goldstone, California, and in Canberra, Australia. However, the radios on board the landers overheated, and they were only rated at 28 kilobits a second anyway. And so we had to back off on the duty cycle, and the scientists were really grumpy about that. So uh, one of the engineers at JPL said, you know, we have an X-band radio on the landers and the rovers, and we also have X-band radios on orbiters, which had been sent before to map the surface of Mars to decide where the rovers were going to go. So we said, well, why don't we reprogram the rovers and the orbiters to use the prototype store and forward software that we had been developing? This is uh, a file distribution system or a file delivery system. So we reprogrammed these things, which is, you know, I mean, God, 200 million miles away, writing new software uh, to upload. Uh, it, it, we, so we put a store and forward system in place in order to support the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers, and it worked. And, oh, and we were getting 128 kilobits a second because the rovers on the surface could transmit up to the orbiters at 128 kilobits a second. The atmosphere is very thin on Mars and the distance was very small compared to going all the way back to Earth. And the, uh, the orbiters had uh, were out of the atmosphere, had much larger uh, solar panels and more power, and could transmit at 128 kilobits uh, back to Earth. So all of the equipment that's landed on Mars, at least in U.S. missions, in the intervening period have been using this store and forward capability. And we are looking forward to the use of the bundle protocols, which have now been standardized in the IETF and also uh, at the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, where all of the um, uh, spacefaring nations uh, collaborate with each other. We've been working with uh, JAXA in Japan and the Korean Space Agency and the European Space Agency and with NASA uh, to, um, to implement these protocols and to uh, consolidate them so they'll be available on any spacecraft that are launched in the future. So in, in the long range, you know, over the next 80 or, or so years, every mission that is launched could have the interplanetary protocols on board. And uh, once they finish their scientific missions, they could be repurposed to be nodes in an interplanetary backbone. So starting in 2024, as we return to the moon and then go on from there in the 2030s to Mars, these protocols will be available for any of the spacefaring nations to make use of uh, free of charge. It's all open source. So I'll stop there and thank you again for your time. Happy to try to answer questions if there are any uh, and uh, wish you well in the rest of the conference. Okay, uh, I'm back. I don't have Slido up though, so uh, I wonder if you can put it up for me. Okay, I, can, I think I need to pin it. Here we go. Okay, I have it. So let's look. Um, Internet's importance is more today than ever. I wonder if this pandemic happened 10 to 15 years ago when Internet speeds weren't, weren't as great. What would we do? Probably we would do what we had to do in 1918, uh, which uh, turned out to be um, not much. I mean, we, we just didn't have the same capability. Uh, I've been astonished that the internet was capable of supporting the amount of traffic that it has, especially given what we're doing right now, which is a two-way 
uh, uplinks uh, historically were lower speed than downlinks, but thanks to uh, just an enormous amount of investment by many of the internet service providers, uh, we have significant amounts of capacity in both directions. Uh, and I, I'm, it's still very clear that we have a long way to go to learn how to use the medium. Anyone who has kids in school or struggling with, and the teachers are struggling to use this uh, are very challenged uh, by the, let's say the uh, uh, premature uh, insistence on using these capabilities because we can't be in proximity to each other until we get control over the pandemic. So uh, it's a huge challenge, and uh, my guess is it would not have been nearly as uh, usable uh, as it is today. However, everyone should recognize that not everyone is able to use the net to work or to go to school. Either they don't have the assets to do it, or the internet isn't available, or their jobs require proximity. So this is uh, this uh, pandemic has shown great fissures and in inequities in our society, in our economic system, and in our technical infrastructure uh, that we now are challenged to solve. So next question, what's the future of the internet? Well, I've hinted at some of it with the interplanetary stuff. It's pretty clear that uh, we will be seeing increased amounts of online uh, activity, more, uh, more applications in cloud-based systems, higher speeds available in wired and wireless settings, 5G and maybe someday 6G. Uh, developments. So all of those things, I believe, will be readily predictable. Uh, there will be, uh, we're all seeing edge computing becoming important where we have collections of devices that are uh, out of the cloud then devices that inter interface them to the cloud uh, and then the cloud itself. Uh, I'm expecting also to see a much more variation now in computing resources that are available. I hinted at that with the quantum computing, for example. Uh, to go along with our GPUs and CPUs in our cloud anyway at Google. Uh, I think the internet is going to become uh, increasingly um, important on a day-to-day -day basis, and it will probably become less and less visible in the same way that we, we probably don't think very much about electricity except for plugging in the wall and expecting it to be there. Uh, I think increasingly people will expect internet to just be there, whether it's wired or wireless. Uh, and of course, there will be many people, some of them uh, you in the audience, that make sure that it is there when people want it. Uh, and for that, of course, we're all very grateful. Uh, what's the Bitrod idea? Uh, this is actually a fairly s simple but scary notion. Uh, think for just a minute about all the photographs that you take. Think about all the um, digital objects that we create, whether it's uh, presentations or uh, you know, uh, text documents or uh, spreadsheets and things like that. These are all software artifacts and they don't work unless there is software to correctly interpret them. So now just imagine that it's your intent that that information that's been created with these various tools be available 100 years from now or 500 years from now. Now in other media, uh, we have had uh, the good fortune that the media have lasted a very long time. Think about cuneiform tablets that got baked in a warehouse fire. They're still readable if you can read cuneiform 5,000 years later. If you look at vellum, which is basically calf skin or goat skin, those manuscripts have lasted anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 years. And so they're very durable. Uh, more recently, uh, paper and, uh, and the printing press comes along and we have uh, rag cotton based paper, which is quite durable, lasts easily 500, 600 years. Uh, we have examples of that. Um, and then we get to uh, wood pulp paper, which comes around the turn of the century in 1800, and it doesn't last very long at all. Uh, it turns brown because it, uh, it absorbs uh, sulfur dioxide, turns it into uh, uh, acid, uh, sulfuric acid, and turns the paper brown. This is especially true of newspaper. You've all seen newspapers turn brown in a few days' time. So the media that we use today for printing, anyway, has become less and less durable than it had in the past. And I challenge you now to think about the durability of uh, digital content. Think about the five and a quarter inch floppy disks and the three and a half inch or floppy disks. It's hard, even if the bits are still there. Uh, and there's some, you know, could be some question about that. You may not be able to find a reader to read them. 
Uh, and now let's go to uh, you know polycarbonate uh, CD-ROMs. Uh, or I have I have photographs from Kodak on CD-ROMs with .exe executables that don't work on my Mac. Um, and if you look at the, even you know the more dense things like DVDs and, and now Blu-ray, it's not clear how long any of those media will last. So one of the issues associated with digital content is the copying of bits from one medium to another to assure that the bits are still there and that there's some way of reading them. But it gets worse because if the software that understands how the bits uh, are to be interpreted is no longer running because it doesn't work on uh, operating systems or hardware of the day, then a lot of the bits will be useless and people will lose uh, important documents then photographs and recordings and other things. So bit rot is, is going to be a tough problem to solve because we have to find an economic purpose, you know, a way of, of sustaining the copying of the bits and the maintaining of software, you know, whether it's backward compatibility or literally emulating old hardware to run old operating systems and old applications in order to interpret, to interpret old bits. So that's a long riff on bit rot. What projects are you working on to get the remaining 47% of the world connected to the internet? A bunch of them. Uh, I have been working with the People Centered Internet, which is a group out in California, uh, to extend internet access to Native American populations. At Google, we have the Google uh, American Indian Network, which is a collection of Native American Googlers who are also working in this space. Uh, there is another group that I chair, the Marconi Society, which is based in Ohio, uh, that is also working on the problem of finding out where is internet not present or inadequately present uh, and uh, and then beginning to work hard on getting uh, policy made in order to uh, fund rural access to the network, or in fact, in some cases, uh, central urban access where it doesn't exist. And there are technical problems, there are literacy problems, and there are economic problems, of course, that get in the way of providing internet access everywhere that it could be used. Uh, others, of course, are investing heavily in this space as well. Google worked hard on putting out optical fiber services, and uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX, as you know, is working on the Starlink system, which involves some 24,000 low-Earth orbit satellites. There are others who are uh, engaged in similar kinds of uh, activity. So in the next decade or so, I expect it may be impossible to avoid access to the Internet, between the satellite-based systems and the 4G, 5G, and someday 6G mobile services. Uh, so hopefully all of that will uh, combine together to give lots of people access to the internet. As browser developers, what can we do to help make the internet more accessible and available to everyone? Well, let me focus as much as I can on two points. The first one is intuitive interfaces, which turn out to be much harder to do than I think a lot of people anticipated. It's obvious when you see an unintuitive interface, but it's not obvious how you design one that is intuitive. And intuitive may vary from person to person. So figuring out and getting insight into intuitive interfaces is super important. Accessible interfaces that provide assistance to people who have uh, various uh, disabilities is vital. And I happen to wear hearing aids. And so I'm a big fan of uh, of the uh, captioning. I'm really happy to see captions in Meets, for example. But I am also happen to, happy to see captions on YouTube uh, and uh, captions in the Google Assistant and things of that sort. So uh, that's just one uh, aspect. If you have hearing, I'm sorry, if you have visual impairments, of course, if you're really blind, you may need screen readers like JAWS. If you are only partially blind, then you may need facilities to blow up fonts and, and to blow up the sizes of, of web pages. But you need to design the web pages in anticipation of this kind of treatment. Uh, otherwise, the things start to overlap and you don't get the effect that you need. So I would say work really, really hard on thinking through what accessibility will mean. Is my website and web page going to be experienced serially? because you had to listen to a screen reader as opposed to being able to see something in two dimensions. How should you design it so that it is intuitive and that the next thing or the hotkey uh, that you need next makes sense? Um, let's see, in 10 years time, uh, what could be the lowest latency uh, town level, country level and globally? Well, you know, the speed of light determines effectively what the latency can be, the minimum latency. 
And so uh, I think all you need to do is to measure the distance, calculate what the speed of light delay is. That's your lower bound. Uh, today, uh, we strive for a 20 millisecond kind of latency uh, for people who want to play games, for instance. Uh, and, but that's a huge challenge when you just calculate how far, that's about halfway across the country. Uh, 20, a 20 millisecond delay is about halfway across the country. Uh, fortunately, the low Earth orbiting satellites are very close in relative terms to us. And so the latency from those sort of large uh, uh, constellations uh, will be, again, potentially in the 50 millisecond range, which is habitable uh, to first order. How do I envision the internet in the year 2520? Well, that's the 26th century. And if you'd asked me about the 24th, I would have been a lot more comfortable because at least I've seen some of that from all the variations on Star Trek. So 25, 20 is much longer. I don't, I'm pretty sure that communication of this kind will still be vital to the societies of that period, uh, but I believe that it will be largely invisible. Uh, a man named uh, Mark Weiser, who passed away at a, at a much too early age at Xerox Park, used to talk about ubiquitous computing, and he implied the computers would sort of melt into the background and the networking that goes with them. And I believe that's correct. So by that time in the 26th century, uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be a lot of programmable devices that are taken for granted, uh, that uh, voice communication will be the norm or a norm, uh, and that uh, the connectivity will almost certainly be uh, at very high speed. Some of it will be optical which has the benefit that it need not leave the room if you close the shutters and, uh, and the doors. Uh, and that will be very attractive for people for whom privacy is an important component of their use of these kinds of systems. So I think that's the last question, unless there are some that come live, others that come live. So, uh, and I haven't been paying close attention to how much time we have left, how are we doing? I have three minutes left. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't I just donate my three minutes back to everybody who might want to take a coffee break. Uh, and thank you very much for what you do. I mean, there's, much of, of your activity has very direct effect on the people that use Google's products and services, and certainly has a direct effect on me. I'm a big user of a lot of the products that emerge out of uh, the people who use our, our uh, software in order to build applications. So let me say thank you for the hard work. I hope you'll be able to address questions of accessibility and utility and intuitive uh, interfaces uh, so that uh, people who uh, use these systems will do so uh, effectively and efficiently and easily. So thanks so much for your time today and thank you for participating in uh, Chromium University. <laughs>